morning, everyone. We have uh, several things to cover today, so I'll get right to it. First, this morning I signed an executive order extending the state of emergency for another month. As a reminder, this is simply a vehicle to maintain measures that limit the spread of the virus. As we begin to vaccinate more Vermonters, it's my hope we'll soon get to a place where we can begin lifting restrictions once again, and then to the point where we no longer need this state of emergency at all. But until then, we need everyone to continue working with us, follow the guidance, protect the most vulnerable, save lives, and protect our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. As I've said before, and I'll say again, now is not the time to let up, and I'm hopeful Vermonters will continue to do their part. Moving to our next announcement, after consultation with the Department of Health, Agency of Education, and others, effective January 18th, we will move into phase two of our sports and recreation guidance. Several weeks ago, as you might recall, we entered phase one, which allowed for the return of youth sports with only skills training and drills allowed. Since then, we've seen no spread of the virus tied to these activities and spread within schools remains low. Phase two allows for teams to expand practices to include drills with limited contact and scrimmages. But as a reminder, games and scrimmages between other teams are still not allowed. Of course, masks will still be required at all times. This will also mean outdoor individual sports, such as downhill or cross-country skiing, may begin in small groups. We know how important these activities are for our kids' well-being, both for their physical and mental health. It's my hope we'll soon be able to allow for competitions, but as we, uh, with every decision we make, it will, be based, it will be based on the data and the advice of our experts. Today, we'll also be discussing the next phase of our vaccination program and make the vaccine available to more of the general public. Again, as a reminder, the 1A group included those who live and work in our long-term care facilities and healthcare workers who we need to keep Vermonters safe and healthy. And I'm pleased to say we are nearing completion of this 1A grouping. Secretary Smith will provide the details of phase two, but beginning January 25th, we'll use age banding and start with those who are 75 and older. Dr. Levine will also talk about those with chronic conditions and how and when they'll be included. Again, this approach is all about vaccinating those more likely to die from COVID so we can protect them as early as possible. And that's why <clears throat> some chronic conditions will be included along with the elderly, all with, it, with the goal of saving lives. As we've discussed many times, the older you are, the more vulnerable you are to severe complications and death due to the virus. Since the beginning of the pandemic, about 92% of Vermont's COVID hospitalizations have been people over the age of 60. And over 80% of deaths have been those over 70. With an incredibly limited supply, we must focus on these populations first. This will not only reduce the number of deaths, but it will also ease the pressure on our hospitals and healthcare systems. We believe this is the simplest and easiest to understand, as well as the most efficient and effective way to vaccinate, for, vaccinate Vermonters more quickly. While this is a significant step forward, it's so important for Vermonters to understand that our supply is limited. So we'll take several weeks to get through each age ban. We know many are anxiously waiting for their vaccines, and rightfully so. And we want to get every dose out just as quick as we possibly can. But with so few doses available, we need everyone to be patient. Finally, 
Before I turn it over to Secretary French for our weekly education update, I want to talk about one of the many hardworking school employees who continued to work so hard over the past few months. Don Marabella is an icon in the South Burlington School District. He's been in public education for over 60 years. And this weekend, he celebrated his 90th birthday. After consulting with his doctor, he still shows up to work every day, serving as a student supervisor. South Burlington is celebrating Dom this week, including putting up a cardboard cutout of him so that students can take pictures with him while keeping their distance. Dom understands how much our kids need school, and he wanted to be there to support them. When he was asked if it was okay with being celebrated this week, uh, he said, make sure to mention how appreciative I am of the students taking the COVID safety rules seriously and allowing me to feel safe coming to work, even at my age. So I want to thank Dom for his incredible service to his community. I want to wish him as well a very, very happy birthday. Uh, Dom is a, uh, yet another ray of kindness and uh, true inspiration to us all. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Um, each month, we conduct a survey of our schools to measure the amount of in-person, uh, remote, and hybrid learning offered to our students. We collect these data at the end of each month, and today I'm going to report on the data that was collected at the end of December. The trends in these data have remained fairly stable since October. Uh, this reflects that schools continue to see low case counts among both students and staff relative to the number of cases in the general population over the same time period. In total, uh, for all grades K-12, through about 30% of our students have been in in-person. Uh, this means they're going to school every day, uh, which is our goal uh, certainly for every student. 50% of our schools have been in hybrid, uh, which means they are in person some days and remote on others and 20% have been fully remote. The trends are different when we break the data out by grade level. Uh, at the elementary level, we see a lot more in-person instruction, uh, where 50% of our elementary schools have been operating in person. This has re virtually remained unchanged uh, each month from October through December. Uh, the trends have remained constant in the other grades as well, but the amount of in-person is significantly lower. Uh, for example, only about 20% of our middle school instruction has been provided through in-person each month uh, of October through December, and high school instruction is about half of that. So in summary, I would observe our schools have been operating consistently over the last several months, uh, even as the case, cases of the virus have increased in all regions of the state. Also, it's fair to say our elementary school students are receiving about twice uh, the amount of in-person as our middle school students and our middle school students are receiving uh, twice as much in person as compared to our high school students. Our distancing requirements probably account uh, for some of these differences. Uh, high schools, for example, uh, not only have more students than our elementary schools, uh, but the distance, distancing requirement for high schools is six feet as opposed to three feet for elementary schools. This means it's more difficult for high schools uh, to have all their students in the building at the same time, which might cause them to have to use more hybrid learning. Uh, next, I'm going to provide an update on our surveillance testing. Uh, each week, we conduct PCR surveillance testing in about 25% of our schools. And each, each week, the testing contains a geographic sample of our school, so we have insight into uh, trends statewide. Testing is voluntary for all school staff. Uh, the results of this week's surveillance testing continue to show that school staff have a much lower positivity rate than the general population. This week, we tested about 2,200 staff, or about 40% of our staff overall. Uh, for the 2,200 tests that we administered, uh, we only uh, identified one positive case. This translates into a positivity rate of about 0.07%, uh, which is significantly lower than the state level positivity rate, which has been hovering around 2.9%. The participation rate of 40% has also been consistent throughout the testing program, which we started in mid-November. Uh, we've had some school districts with particip participation rates as high as 80%, uh, but some with much lower rates. 
For example, it's not unusual to see a large group of districts with participation rates around 60% um, while also having one or two in the 20% range. In spite of that variability, uh, however, um, I think we can conclude these test results are a good indicator that our schools are operating very safely. And our teachers and our school staff deserve a great deal of credit for doing uh, their part to prevent the spread of the virus. In addition, our epidemiological data continues to show little evidence of school level transmission of the virus. This means that when we do see the virus in the school, it's because students and staff brought, the school, uh, brought it to school from community interactions. It's still very rare that students and staff catch the virus or transmit the virus in the school itself, although we have seen a small number of cases uh, where that has occurred. This is a very remarkable achievement considering the circumstances we've been through in the last several months. Um, and these data are what give us confidence that we'll be able to return to more in-person instruction in the coming months ahead when the benefits of vaccine distribution start to take hold. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French, and good morning. I'll start today with the progress we've made to date uh, on, vac on vaccines, then the plan going forward, and then talk about what, we will be, what will be happening next week with the limited doses we have received. First, keep in mind that Vermont is focused on using all available doses as quickly as we can, and as effectively as we can to protect those most at risk of death and those who care for them. Vaccine distribution is our highest priority project. The governor has been clear that our mission is to do everything that we can to vaccinate Vermonters as quickly as the receipt of the vaccine doses will allow. And that is our focus. And we are going to meet the goals the governor set out in his inaugural address. As long as, as, long as the supply is steady, which is currently about 8,800 doses each week, we will have vulnerable Vermonters vaccinated by the end of the winter. And if the supply of doses increases, we'll get to them faster. Since March, we have designed, implemented, and calibrated several large-scale public-facing efforts to address COVID-19, including mass testing, contact tracing, PPE and food distribution. But it's important to note that vaccine distribution is the most complex one yet because it involves so many moving pieces from changing information about the number of doses the federal government is shipping each week to implementing an easy and reliable system to schedule tens, hundreds of thousands of Vermonters and coordinating distribution of a highly temperature sensitive, sensitive medicine that is, this is a complex undertaking. We are making good progress, as I said, and we are appreciative of the public's patience and cooperation as we move forward. Like with all large rollouts, there will be some bumps, but we'll learn from those bumps, and if we make mistakes, we'll own them. And every step of the way, we will be focused on making the process easier, smoother, and faster for Vermonters. But I want to stress again, the major limiting factor in the speed of vaccinations is that number of doses being manufactured and shipped to the states. The more doses we get, the faster we can end this pandemic. Here's what we've accomplished so far. We have administered our first dose, doses of vaccine on December 15th, just about a month ago, and launched our program to vaccinate Vermonters in nursing home and long-term care facilities, as well as our frontline health workers. To date, we have administered nearly 35,000 doses, nearly 30,000 people. And all skilled nursing facilities have completed their first dose of the vaccine. As you recall, and I've said this before, skilled nursing facilities are where our most frail and vulnerable seniors are in many cases. 
and we're on track to, these facilities are on track to receive their second dose by the end of this month. 84 out of 103 residential care and 12 out of 18 assisted living will be completed, facilities will be completed with their first dose by the end of next week with the plan to have all assisted living and residential living facilities getting their first dose by the end of the month. Our hospitals have vaccinated significant numbers of patient care staff and community-based providers, including EMS and home health and hospice workers, and are currently working on home health care support staff as well. This work has taken tremendous effort, and I want to extend my appreciation to our hospitals who have led the clinics statewide, as well as the community-based providers, home and health and hospice agencies, EMS, fire and police, for all that you have done to get us to where we are today. We are near, nearly finished with phase 1A, and we can be proud of this accomplishment, even though we know there's much more work to do and our work is far from over. Now we are ready to transition to the next phase, which is called phase two. Phase two is the beginning of the distribution of vaccines by age. We will begin this phase the week of January 25th, and we will start with those aged 75 and older. Again, it's critical that Vermonters know that we are very limited in the number of doses we receive each week. And I wanna show this next slide here and the reason why we are choosing 75 and above, and in essence, 65 and above in this, in this uh, second phase. As we've shown previously, the data shows that the older you are, the greater you are, the greater risk you are of serious illness and death from coronavirus. In fact, above the red line on the right, you will see that the, that the risk increases significantly after the age of 65. And it increases even more significantly after the age of 75. There are about 49,000 Vermonters in the 75 plus age group. And given our current allocation of approximately eight to 9,000 doses per week, this age group should take about six weeks to complete. Of course, what we really need is greater quantities of vaccine in the weeks ahead so that we can speed up our efforts. But we want to set appropriate expectations and communicate clearly where we are and what we expect to avoid the frustration and disappointment we've seen in other states. So here's how the plan will work. Starting with the 75 plus age group, beginning on January 25th, you will be able to register online or by calling. We will share the website and phone number when we get closer to the 25th, along with the guidance for ensuring that we have an orderly process to take calls and get eligible Vermonters their appointments as efficiently as possible. I want, to be, I want to be very clear about this. We expect that there will probably be more calls than online registration at first. So we are going to need children, grandchildren, or other relatives to help their older loved ones use the online tool as much as possible to keep our call centers from being overwhelmed. Once you have an appointment, it will be very important that you make every effort to keep it. Cancellations and unplanned no-shows would cause doses to be spoiled. So again, when you make an appointment, it is very important that you keep it. Please do not make an appointment if you aren't sure you will be able to keep it. Clinics will begin on January 27th. Some of the, these will be regional clinics set up by the state 
and some will be through partner hospitals, providers, and pharmacies. Our goal will be to administer every available dose each week. Here's what we expect regarding second doses. We expect individuals to make their appointment for their second dose at the time and place you are administered your first dose. We continue to follow closely how the federal government is handling allocations and we'll do everything we can to ensure we have a supply for the, for the second vaccine dose while we move through the initial vaccination dose process. For those who are homebound and not able to travel to a vaccine clinic, the local EMS and home health agencies will partner to provide vaccines to those individuals. More information on this will be available in the coming days. So remember, Registration will not begin until the 25th. It will be for Vermonters over age 75 only. And you will need to use the online tool or the call center to register. Our preference, as I said before, is that everybody use the online tool. Vermonters should not call their own healthcare providers or hospitals directly to try to get appointments. Again, we will provide the online registration information and call-in number before registration begins on the 25th. Before I move on, I want to say again that the vaccine is in limited supply. We are trying to get through this age grouping as quick as possible so that we can move on to the next group. If there is more vaccine, we will add capacity and, vac and vaccinate quicker. We have designed the system where it is scalable depending on the vaccine, and we can scale up uh, fast if we get other um, doses of vaccine. Along the way, we will communicate with Vermonters about the opportunities, but given our current supply, it will take us weeks to get through, as I said, about six weeks to get through the 75 plus group. Between now and when the next phase starts on January 25th, that's today and before the 25th, we must ensure we maximize the usage of available doses. For next week, we will grant permission to hospitals to administer any vaccines available in their inventory and not needed for phase 1A to begin the vaccination of patients 75 or older who are in a hospital inpatient unit. That means in the hospital and are able to return for a second vaccination and have medical clearance. This will not include patients who are in the ED, the emergency departments. This will be a very limited number of doses, but will allow us to maximize the utilization of doses for the most vulnerable and help us begin the transition to phase two as soon as possible. Again, you should not call your doctor or local hospital or visit the emergency department for this. Doses will be in short supply and allocated to inpatients who are eligible only. And it's only for this week of transition. And the hospital will manage that along with the second dosage planning for these individuals. Finally, with these plans, we're working towards a less chaotic, safer, and ultimately faster way to administer this vaccine than what we've seen in other states. After 75, we'll begin vaccinating the next age group, which we expect will be Vermonters age 70 plus, using the same system with adjustments based upon lessons learned from the first age grouping, and then 65 plus, and so on, modifying the pacing of the age bands based upon dosages available. Given current proje projections, we can expect to be finished with the 65 group, as I said in the beginning, by the end of the winter. I know this is a lot to cover. Believe me, I know it is a lot to cover. But I also know the public is very eager to learn how vaccines will roll out for them. Please be patient as we stand up 
and implement this system. Teams are working day and night to get this in place with the goal of creating a rapid, efficient, workable process that will help save more lives. As I said, we'll have more information in the days and weeks ahead, including information about vaccine locations around the state and how to register when your age band is called. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Secretary Smith. In the beginning part of my comments, I'll be also dwelling on vaccination and uh, repeat a little of what you've heard, uh, provide some new information. But first, I'd like to uh, just step back for a moment. I know many people across the state are anxious to know when they or their loved ones will be able to get vaccinated, whether it be an older parent or a grandparent, someone living with a condition that means they could get very sick from COVID, a person who's around other people because of the nature of their work, or someone at risk simply because they're black or indigenous or a person of color. And believe me, we've heard from many of you and we do understand your concerns. I wanna say that whoever you are and whatever your circumstances, we wanna get the vaccine to you as soon as we can. And we're glad to hear from so many people that they actually do want the vaccine to protect themselves and help protect other Vermonters. We wish we had enough vaccine right now to give to everyone who wants it. We're working on getting people the vaccines we do have as carefully and efficiently as possible. As you've heard from the Secretary, it is a complicated process that's changing quickly and we still have a long way to go. But I know that with the same patience and understanding Vermonters have had throughout this pandemic, this vaccine will ultimately, ultimately get us all closer to life as it once was with our family, friends, and communities. Now, now that you know a lot more about our plans, we're anticipating there'll be lots of interest and questions. This will be good news for many people, but I again need to ask for your patience and help as we finalize some of the systems you've heard about so they can be rolled out as smoothly as possible. So I wanna reiterate, the next phase of vaccination will only be open to those age 75 or older, and you'll not be able to make an appointment until January 25th. We're not sharing the phone number to make an appointment because we're not yet scheduling appointments. You'll not be able to make one by calling any other health department phone number. So please hold off on calling or emailing until we provide you with this information. And as I've mentioned previously, please don't call your own healthcare provider or hospital for vaccine appointments either. By waiting until we have more details to share, you'll be helping our staff focus on the difficult and complex work to prepare for this next phase which of course is age 75 and older, could be nearly 50,000 people alone. So this process will take time. It depends on any changes in our allocation of vaccine from the federal government. When the allocation uh, shows there's enough available, we'll announce when the next age group will become eligible, carefully making sure that we overlap the phases so we do not waste vaccine at the end of one phase that could go to individuals in the next. Now we've mentioned previously we're going to prioritize people with certain medical conditions for this vaccine. Under our current plan, once we finish the group that's age 65 or older, people ages 18 to 65 with medical conditions that put them at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19 as identified by the CDC, will be eligible next. Now, the definition of severe illness is hospitalization, admission to an ICU, intubation or mechanical ventilation, or death. The conditions that put one at higher risk are current cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, also known as emphysema, 
a variety of heart conditions, such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, or problems with the heart muscle called cardiomyopathies, an immunocompromised state, meaning a weakened immune system, often related to an organ transplant or other immune disorders, severe obesity, pregnancy, type 2 diabetes, Down syndrome, and sickle cell disease. We are also, as I've told you previously, very committed to addressing the historical and current factors that contribute to health disparities. Equity is what we term a cross-cutting consideration throughout our vaccination efforts. There's no question that members of certain demographic groups have been disproportionately overrepresented in Vermont's COVID-19 infection hospitalization, and death rates. This means we must prioritize these groups to reach our goal of preserving life and protecting those most at risk. Because of these increased risks and because of historical harms and the resulting mistrust of healthcare and public health, we will ensure that black, indigenous, and people of color in Vermont are provided not only the information but also the access they need as part of our vaccination efforts. We've been working with community leaders, we have listened to them, and we are committed to continuing to right past wrongs. We will ensure that this community gets the support they need in the language they need, in the locations they need to make informed choices and to get scheduled for vaccinations. And while we wait and work for the time when every Vermonter has the opportunity to be vaccinated so that we're all protected and the virus is at bay, we must stay committed every day to taking the actions that can keep the virus from spreading. Masks on faces, six-foot spaces, uncrowded places. And I urge you to take advantage of the many daily testing opportunities. If you think you've been exposed, if you've slipped up in one way or another, if you're just worried, get a test. It's free, it's easy, and it's readily available at our test sites throughout the state. Go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 for ways to register for that. Now to just give a brief health update. After 197 cases, Two days ago, yesterday we reported 142 cases. Our positivity rate stands at 2.7%. As we've stated previously, we're watching the hospitalization rate very closely. Currently, we have 44 people in the hospital, six in an ICU. Sadly, the total number of deaths has now risen to 163. Many of us never thought we would see this, but I strongly suspect the next time we meet with you, we will have surpassed 10,000 cases in Vermont. Now, we're following 42 outbreaks and 396 situations. Let's take a little deeper look at our outbreak data. I want you to note, first off, that only 11% of cases currently are associated with an outbreak. So either many are not part of one, or we haven't found out that they are. As you know, driving the outbreaks for the longest period of time has been the long-term care facilities. They are in light blue. And as I've alluded to in previous press conferences recently, they are playing a more diminishing role over the last week or two. Um, there are still plenty of outbreaks in those facilities, but they are not growing, either in numbers within a facility or numbers of facilities. Which means many of the outbreak cases are related to household transmission. And in the community, as seen in this more magenta or purplish color, I would call it, now, the county that has the highest positivity rate is Addison County, which is related to an outbreak. But in the rest of the state, 
the main driver of the positivity rate is really unknown or contact with a known case suggesting community transmission of infection. So you can see the marked increase in the color purple as we come closer to current times. I also want you to note that if we look at the um, very top of the uh, curve uh, bars here in that orange-brown color, that is schools and child cares. So please note that there's almost no impact of schools and child cares on this outbreak data at the present time. Nor, by and large, are workplaces represented in green uh, responsible for a large amount of the outbreak activity either. So by far, the largest outbreak that's going on at this point in time, which now stands at 115 cases, is the Victory Baptist Church in Addison County. The majority of those cases, though, are primary cases and in multiple households who attended some of the three services or all of the three services over Christmas. They're not, there do not appear to be any significant secondary outbreaks. I will add that church staff have been very cooperative and forthcoming, and we continue to work with all communities of faith to aid them in understanding and implementation of the operating requirements as set out in our executive order. The Health Department calls on Vermonters to respond to the many illnesses in this particular faith community and in all our communities with empathy and concern knowing that this virus could impact any of our own families or neighbors. We should also let this outbreak provide a teachable moment for us all, showing the power of the virus to create a community health risk, simply by a number of people who are asymptomatic but potentially infectious being present together, engaging in joyful activities such as singing. Now, I also get a lot of questions about ski areas. Most of the situations that we see at our many ski resorts are related to sporadic cases among employees in a range of positions, some in ski operations, others in ski schools, restaurants, or retail. The same type of mix that we can find in other businesses besides the ski industry. We are not seeing cases of transmission from skiing itself or from social activities related to skiing. And finally, to pick up on the theme that opened uh, this uh, conference today from the governor regarding youth sports, since we did allow them to resume team-based skills and drills, while we have a very few instances of a youth attending a practice while infectious, there are no known instances of spread to teammates or even teammates being close contacts due, due to what I would call strong adherence to our current guidelines. That's it for the opening comments, and I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. All right, folks, it is quarter of 12, and we have a record 31 reporters in the queue. So I'm asking folks to uh, listen to each other. Don't ask repeat questions. Keep your questions to one or two, and I may have to move us along if we get stuck on somebody too long. We'll start in the room with Kelly. Um, thank you, Governor. So this is probably for Secretary Smith. So um, you mentioned that we've um, been given about 69,800 doses, and we've administered about 35,000. So that's about 50%. Um, I guess my, my first question is, the CDC says that we are reporting, or that we've administered 42%. Um, so I guess, where, where is that disconnect? Federal government. I, I don't know what the disconnect. I mean, I looked at the CDC uh, website today. We're seventh in the nation in terms of uh, distribution. Um, I will say this. I, I looked at the, the warehouse. We have 
only 100 doses in the warehouse, so it means it's out for distribution. Uh, the federal pharmacy program has had uh, issues with recording what they have, um, what they have administered. For example, two days ago I checked and there were 2,000 that they hadn't uh, put into the system yet in terms of uh, registration. And some of it is second dose. Um, that, and you gotta realize, when you have second dose, uh, you can only administer that second dose on a time period. So you can get the second dose and have to sit on it until that second dose is ready to be administered on the date that it is. I think it's a combination of those those several things. But I, if you look at the CDC website in terms of how this state is doing, in terms of putting uh, vaccination that we're getting into people, um, you can see we're some of the top, we're one of the top in the nation. And um, Dr. Levine, earlier you mentioned, um, you know, we've been talking about it for the past couple uh, weeks, or months even, but, um, you know, getting the vaccine to marginalized communities, BIPOC communities, you know, you, you talk about outreach in the community leaders and, and that sort of thing. I guess physically, I mean, what, what does that look like? I guess if you could just provide a concrete example of, you know, how the state plans to reach out to a lot of these communities. Absolutely. So we have a lot of strong community ties right now through a variety of networks. We have an entire health equity team at the health department. The health department is part of uh, community meetings that have community leaders, both from the community of color themselves, as well as from the municipal leadership. Uh, we have a racial equity task force and an advisory group as well that is engaged. Um, so all of that is part of the background and part of the setting the foundation for the effort that we're going to talk about. There's tremendous amount of work that's been done um, and it will continue to be done in an educational and uh, messaging framework, also paying careful attention to interpretation. But our biggest focus now is really on making sure that the communities are comfortable with the concept and notion of vaccination, that they are eager to be vaccinated, and then as we get into these um, gr large groupings that we've just talked about, make sure that we're engaging the members of their community who are eligible in that way. And if it even requires providing uh, vaccination opportunities within walking distance, within neighborhoods, as opposed to having to go to a more central facility, making sure that that community has that opportunity uh, right up front so that they can take advantage of that. There's also an opportunity, um, because we're investing a bunch of resources and we'll be in interacting with family members, because congregate living is somewhat common and there are large households, uh, being able to make sure that we can educate and involve and if necessary, and because people want it, vaccinate uh, the contingent in the entire household. Thank you. Steve? Uh, this may be for you, Governor, uh, Commissioner Harrington, but uh, we haven't heard an update yet on uh, how things are going with uh, the new PPP um, program and how that's uh, rolling out. I believe uh, small business can now uh, go ahead and register and, or put their applications in, or am yeah, I wrong? Um, I may refer to uh, Secretary Curley on this, but. Um, as I think I reported on Tuesday, uh, there were some entities uh, that were uh, allowed to move forward, uh, some banks uh, that were select few uh, that were allowed to move forward. And this is the federal government uh, steering the way, the SBA. Um, so by the end of this week, we had hoped uh, that there would be more uh, that would be uh, put online. Now, I don't know uh, how many have, uh, have been uh, given the go ahead, um, but uh, maybe Maybe Secretary Curley or Commissioner Goldstein might have that answer. Yeah, uh, Governor, you know, I don't know exactly how many um, of the smaller lenders, they're, they're by definition lenders who have uh, one billion or less in assets, were able to accept um, applications uh, as of today. So I don't know exactly how many of those are in Vermont. But by Tuesday, all of our um, PPP eligible lenders will be able to accept applications. And 
really the message we want to get out to Vermont businesses is that we want to make sure that you get into get your application in early. So even if your particular bank may not accept applications until Tuesday, it's important for you to be in touch with them and um, be ready to get in early because it's the first come first serve. And um, also just want to mention if, if some of our small businesses don't already have relationships with a lender, um, Vita is ready to help. So um, there's a variety of ways that you can, can get in there and get in there early. And we really want to make sure that they, they do so because we're, we're really uncertain what if any um, other relief will be coming down the pipe. So this is a, a really good chance to, to uh, jump on that today. And finally, Governor, just uh, as we roll into the next uh, week, um, your advice to Vermonters uh, as far as the, uh, the weekend uh, possible activities as, as well as the, uh, the activities in Washington next week? Yeah, uh, hopefully uh, that we have a very peaceful week. Um, we have uh, we've been preparing uh, here in Vermont. Uh, as well as sending guard troops uh, to Washington, D.C., has been requested. Um, but uh, my hope, my sincere hope, is uh, that we're overprepared and that we won't have to use any of the resources that we have available and ready to go. Um, but, um, but I feel good about, uh, again, uh, the briefings I receive on a daily basis about uh, our preparedness and, uh, and hopefully, again, uh, that uh, we'll all do our part uh, to make sure that we have a very peaceful peaceful transition of power in D.C., but also if there are any protests or rallies of any sort, and, and I'm discouraging them, um, but if there are, uh, that uh, they're done in a peaceful manner. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify, given what HHS said uh, on Tuesday and what you've outlined today, uh, HHS and, and the Biden people were talking about 65 plus and releasing all second dose inventories. You're sticking with 75. Uh, and there are now reports that there is no second dose inventory that is now forthcoming from the federal government. So is that the reason you're sticking with 75 plus? Well, again, and I may have uh, Secretary Smith uh, clean this up a bit, but uh, from our standpoint, we just want a simple, easily distinguishable uh, procedure so that everybody understands what we're doing. This is something that we planned in the beginning. Uh, it's going to take us uh, a few weeks to get through even the 75 plus and over uh, range uh, just due to the supply. So uh, if we get more supply, we'll get through that band uh, much quicker and then we'll move on to the next band. So I, I don't believe um, that that opening this up in any way. We've seen what's happened in other states when they've opened it up uh, and it, it, it's been chaotic at times. Uh, there's a lot of overpromising, a lot of high expectations, and we just want to make sure that we're realistic uh, about what we're getting. Again, if we get more supply, if there's more vaccine that's sent to Vermont, we'll, we'll scale up. We'll, we'll put it in the arms of Vermonters. We're able to do that. Uh, very easily. So that's the beauty of uh, the plan that we put together. Simplistic and effective. Oh. Stuart Mike Smith okay. here. Stuart Mike Smith here. I just wanted to, um, we've based this plan on our current allocation. Um, there, uh, you know, I've seen other states that have sort of opened up on a wing and a prayer uh, that there'll be more allocation coming in, but we've based this plan on an allocation on both the first dose that we, you know, currently are having, which is our current allocation is about 8,800 a month, and uh, and based on a second dose uh, coming in on that. So that's what our plan is based on. Okay, um, and Governor, do you have any um, initial thought about the? incoming president's nearly $2 trillion relief package unveiled last night? Yeah, I was on a uh, call yesterday afternoon with the National Governors Association, and we were briefed on uh, some of the particulars of, uh, of the speech that uh, uh, Governor, or President-elect uh, Biden had uh, given last night. Uh, all seems, I mean, there, there are some areas of concern, uh, but, uh, but we'll see how it plays out. It'll be submitted to Congress and uh, I know our congressional delegation, led by Senator Leahy, uh, will always uh, have 
have our backs uh, in Vermont. So um, uh, we're hopeful this would be uh, uh, great news uh, for Vermont if it uh, came to fruition. Uh, and uh, and it's much needed in a lot of different sectors. Uh, the the economic uh, need in particular uh, for those, the hospitality industry, would be very beneficial for Vermont. Thanks. Ed, the Newport Daily Express. Yeah, good, uh, good day. I have uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, for daycare operators and teachers, I was called and asked to ask this question today. Uh, where do they fit in? Are they in phase one or are they regulated to the uh, age bands? Yeah, they, everyone is in the age band at this point, uh, other than those with uh, chronic, chronic conditions that we've uh, talked about or Dr. Levine had talked about for another phase. But uh, right now, everyone is in the age banding, taking care of those who are greatest risk of dying if they uh, uh, contract uh, the, the COVID virus. So that's where we're focusing. Okay, and the second question is, uh, while I understand that you will have like home health care agencies and so on um, being part of an outreach program to get people who are at home, there's also large populations of vulnerable people who do not uh, have uh, access or do not have a home health care agent or other people working with them. Uh, how do you uh, reach out to them proactively to make sure they know about the uh, vaccine and that they're eligible. Yeah, we're, and we're hoping uh, to have your help, uh, Ed, and uh, the help of the media in describing uh, what, what's available. Uh, but uh, but I'll let Secretary Smith answer the rest of it. Uh, you know, we have a plan uh, where we can get to those in the most rural areas as well. Okay. Yeah, Ed, as I said in my remarks, we'll have, um, we will have clinics in every part of the state. Um, and one of the things, and those that cannot travel or are homebound, we will reach out through uh, either EMS or in partnership with uh, home health. So the individuals you described, I think we will be able to get through through EMS. Thank you very much. Pat, WCAS. Hi. I have a question on the timeline for the vaccination strategy. If it takes six weeks to vaccinate the 75-plus group, that takes us into early March. If we're going to finish everyone 65-plus before the end of winter, that really only gives us a couple weeks after that to get to everyone else between 65 and 74. Uh, is that time frame realistic, and will those age bands then overlap enough to allow that timeline to be possible? Secretary Smith. Yeah, Kat, you, um, one of the things that we're hoping as we move forward here is that, first of all, you got to take some off the top in terms of uh, who's been vaccinated already through long-term care facilities. So that will help speed up the process. Second of all, not everybody, although we're planning for everybody, but not everybody will take the vaccine. We know that a high percentage of this age group takes the vaccine, but not everybody takes the vaccine. So we think that, um, you know, end of, uh, end of winter, beginning of spring is a realistic sort of time frame as we, as we move forward. And if another COVID vaccine is approved this winter, because we know there are a couple more that are in, you know, in stages of trials, would that significantly change your planning and your timeline? Absolutely. And and frankly, Kat, if we've got, we've designed this system to be scalable, hoping that um, there'll be more vaccine that will be coming, either through a new vaccine that's approved or um, more vaccine coming through the existing pipeline. If w we have uh, we have the ability to scale this significantly, this is all based upon available vac vaccine right now. That's that's the game plan. Um, you can't you you know you can't. Per I personally can't produce vaccine. We have to wait for it from the federal government. So as soon as we get it, and if it can scale up uh, on production and delivery, we can scale up here to deliver it faster. 
Are you hearing that production is going like pretty well on from these companies? Like they're able to keep up? I, in terms of what we we based it as I as I told Stuart, we based it upon what we're getting now in 8,800 doses. We based it on 8,800 doses and what we're getting now. So, is it um, you know? If we get more than 8,800 doses, we'll speed it up. And Thank it, you. I can just add to that that the government has boldly stated that by the summertime, 400 million doses of the current two vaccines will be out there available, which means 200 million Americans. So that if we take that as a uh, positive indicator, means allocations will rev up as these months go by. Got it. Appreciate it. And again, I just want to remind everyone in the beginning, I think we were promised about 11 or 12,000 doses uh, and that we would not go any lower than that. And here we are uh, at uh, 80, 88, 8,900. So, um, we just are going to administer this and, and distribute this just as fast as we can get it in. Lisa, the AP. Hi, thank you. Just a, a clarification. So um, you're thinking, Secretary Smith, that by uh, early March is when the 65 and up might start getting vaccines? I think um, by, you know, the... Early March is not spring, but I think it's like the 15th or so. But um, the uh, I was uh, I was thinking around between the 15th and the end of March as as what we're looking at beginning of April. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can I just clarify that? I mean, with the uh, sure. that would be from 65 up. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Erin, BT Digger? Um, are you concerned about lifting those restrictions on, um, you know, increased school contact sports with the case rate throughout the state rising? I mean, I understand that there haven't been any cases traced to those sports so far, but health experts say that, uh, you know, incorporating more contact into school sports will significantly increase the risk of transmission. Um, I don't, yeah, Aaron, I don't know uh, which health experts you've been talking to, but the ones I consult with um, have felt comfortable uh, going to this next phase. That's why we did it. Uh, if there was any discomfort amongst our health experts, we wouldn't have gone to the second phase. Uh, I might ask Dr. Levine to comment further on that. We don't actually know that cases are rising in the state right now. I mean, we kind of are plateauing, but we'll see which direction things go. But regarding move to phase two of what it's called for the school sports, um, that does allow, you're right, a little more contact, but it's not a dramatic change compared to where the students have been thus far. And it's certainly a place to see how things go for several weeks before we would advance things any further. <clears throat> Using our kind of policy of making sure we at least go through one, if not two incubation periods of the virus, between any moves that we would make. Um, if we hadn't seen such exemplary safety in what's going on right now, obviously that would give us pause. Okay, um, also just a quick clarification. I, I, when you were listing the uh, conditions that might qualify um, for priority for the vaccine, I didn't hear smoking, which I know is on the CDC list. Is that intended to be one of the conditions that would qualify you in Vermont for a higher priority? So in Vermont, we've chosen to not include smoking on the list. Um, not, not that, it, and, and it's not really a condition. Um, uh, we've chosen to go mostly with the conditions that predispose one to a more serious outcome. 
Having... Okay, thank you. What should people in border areas like the Upper Valley or Southern Vermont do about a vaccine? Should they, if they're doctors in New Hampshire, per se, should they be trying to attend a Vermont vaccination clinic or a pharmacy in Vermont? And do you have to prove residency to get a vaccine in Vermont? Secretary Smith. You will have to prove residency um, in Vermont uh, to get a vaccine in Vermont. There are special um, special instances. It's if your provider is in Vermont, then we will allow that to happen. But in most cases, and there are there, you know, that would be an exception. But in most cases, you will have to be a Vermont resident to get vaccinated in Vermont. So if someone lives in the Upper Valley, but there are doctors in New Hampshire, they should still seek to get a vaccine in Vermont. I, I would. Okay. Yeah, unless, uh, by the way, unless they can get it in New Hampshire, go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Courtney, Local 22. Seen reports of businesses boarding up storefronts as a cautionary measure um, for the week ahead. I'm wondering if you guys have heard any of the sorts in Vermont, and if you feel that's necess necessary action to take. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of any in Vermont. Obviously, we're going to be watching and monitoring the situation, uh, particularly uh, next week when the inauguration takes place. Um, but, uh, but at this point in time, we're not seeing anything that I know of. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, anything you want to add to that? No, nothing to add to that. Yeah. Commissioner Sherling is shaking his head no. He has heard nothing uh, of that uh, sort either. Okay, thank you. Cameron, St. Albans Messenger. Hi there. So uh, I had a couple of quick questions. Um, with, is there any concern about call volume uh, and any sort of bottlenecks once the phone number is released um, and plans to address that? And also, I um, couldn't help but notice uh, on the list, it didn't sound like asthma was one of the conditions, and I was just curious uh, why that would be. Um, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer the first one, Dr. Levine the second one, but, uh, but again, from our perspective, we are concerned about call volume. That's why we would, we would like everyone uh, to uh, go online if possible. Uh, if they're not capable of doing it themselves, uh, to maybe have a family member assist them, uh, that would be the most expeditious way to do it and cut down on the number of calls that we expect will be flooding in. Uh, that's part of uh, what we want to ramp up. Uh, we do have an outside uh, entity that is helping us monitor the phones and and to uh, to administer the registration program. But uh, but again, um, we have advocate for people to go uh, to go online. Uh, that's the best way to do this if you possibly can. Dr. E. Smith. Okay. Uh, second question. So the second question had to do with asthma. So. To be very clear, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, emphysema, is on the list of conditions that will put you at increased risk of a more serious outcome if you have COVID. I'm really actually pleased to say that asthma is not on that list. It is on a list of conditions that could possibly put you at increased risk. And the reason it's framed that way is the scientific evidence and database. It's very supportive of COPD. It really doesn't support currently asthma. We want asthmatics to be careful, obviously. We want them to maintain their maintenance therapy that they would always use to prevent any exacerbations of asthma during a time of um, getting a viral infection of any sort. Um, but it's not on the list of conditions that uh, is evidence-based at this point. Hi, um, I had a, just a quick clarification um, from, that I wanted to ask Dr. Levine about what, what you were talking 
when you Calvin asked you about prioritizing communities of color, you mentioned sort of um, the congregate situations that, that some folks are living in and that, you know, someone in that household getting vaccinated. I just, I just wanted to clarify, were you saying that people in the congregate living situations like that would also be able to get vaccinated in addition to the people in the age bands? Or just wondering if you could clarify that comment from earlier. Yes, we think that that could be most efficient uh, at that time. So um, that's, that's a definite possibility for people in those households. Um, I think I got the gist of your question. You broke up a little in the beginning, but the answer, yeah, so the answer is yes, if, if that's what if your question who, was. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if someone's 75 in one of those households and they're living with 10 other people, if those other people in the household would be able to be vaccinated at, at that time as well. Yeah, and that's one of the strategies that we're exploring to see if we can make that happen because, again, uh, all of the community resources will be going to that interaction at that time anyways. Okay. Um, and then I think this would be for, I believe, Secretary Smith. Um, you mentioned you really want people to keep the appointment so the vaccines don't spoil. Um, what is the sort of backup plan if uh, people don't make those appointments? Because inevitably, I think that is going to happen. Um, do you have a plan to make sure the vaccines get used? Sure, we're working on what is called a callback system. That if somebody's wor if we're we're going to make sure we're going to have a list of people that are within 30 minutes, and if there is a vacant spot, that we would call that person or call off that list to bring in uh, people in in case there's a vacancy. Um, you know, most of this vaccine can wait to the end of the day. It can't wait forever, but it can wait for the end of the day. We can we can perhaps uh, do something at that point. Okay, and do you sort of have a, do you have, a, I guess I would call it like an acceptable loss percentage, like a number of vaccines that, that you'd be willing to let spoil before reassessing the plan? N no, we're, we, we're, we're trying to make sure that there's no spoilage along the way. Um, that's why we have this sort of a backup plan to the backup plan. Uh, in case there's no shows uh, along the way. Um, the, that is um, what we're looking at. We're also looking at if, if, we, if EMS has a list of people that it has uh, available and if we can move up a scheduled uh, visit on a homebound person, that's probably what we would do. All right, we're gonna go to Tom. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Governor, I just have one question. Uh, you referenced uh, earlier in responding to a uh, question about President-elect Biden's uh, proposed package that he announced last evening. You referenced the state's hospitality and lodging sector as having been particularly hard hit. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about any funding that may flow from the second stimulus package that was passed by Congress. Uh, in uh, in December, in terms of what your administration might do to collaborate with the legislature to get more immediate emergency funding to the lodging sector. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, there wasn't any direct uh, payments that we can make uh, through that economic package. Most of that money for uh, businesses will be through the PPP. Uh, we're trying to engage, trying to make sure that uh, all of these businesses are prepared uh, to to use that uh, that uh, venue uh, to satisfy their needs. So that's why we focus so much on that and want people to be prepared. We want them to make sure they get to the front of the line because it is uh, first come first serve, and uh, fill out their applications uh, now, even if they can't uh, um, submit them to the bank. Um, fill them out now uh, in anticipation of their their bank being approved, or we'll find them another institution that will. Uh, Secretary Curley, okay. is there anything that I missed on that? No, Governor, you're right. I mean, as, as you said, we don't have the, the discretionary money to spend at the state level like we did in the in the last um, federal relief package. So um, just getting in the end 
Um, the, the NAICS code 72, which is, which is food and accommodations, definitely has the ability, I, I can't uh, uh, say it off the top of my head, but they have the ability to get a little bit more, uh, a larger loan, I believe. So um, hopefully that will really um, address some of the, the pain that they continue to feel. Thank you very much, Governor and Secretary Curley. Appreciate it. Thank you. Andrea, seven days. Hi, this is Colin Flanders filling in for Andrea. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a better picture of what these vaccine clinics will, clinics will look like as far as how many there might be and, and where they might be located. I know you gave some broad examples, but um, are they going to be distributed throughout the state? Uh, just a little more info on that. Yeah, Colin, um, this is Mike Smith. You'll, you'll probably see them along the, the health district line, so about 14 of them uh, distributed around the state in uh, terms of uh, what, they, uh, what they will look like. It's pretty much what you will see in a testing. You'll have a receptionist. You'll have somebody that will check you in. You'll have somebody that will make sure it's you. Um, and then you'll have somebody that administers your shot. And then you'll have somebody that uh, vi uh, visually um, observes you for 15 minutes or more. Uh, before you leave. So um, it won't be in the district offices. We are, we are making sure we are getting places where there's plenty of parking and plenty of space. Thanks. And then my only other question is, um, as far as the software phone appointment system, I mean, how confident are you that this is not going to be um, a mess that we've seen in these other states? I know you're stressing that people should use the online system, but I, I will say that we have heard complaints about the, the usability of even the testing appointment system. And so um, we'd just like to get a little more on that. How confident are you that, that we're not going to be back here in a few weeks um, talking about bottlenecks that we've seen, for example, with the unemployment system? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we have done is that we've taken, just remember, we, we roll through about 30, 35,000 tests a week on average. It was way up over uh, 35,000 uh, last week on a seven day period. So we're fairly familiar of large amounts of people uh, coming through one of, our, one of our platforms in terms of testing. Um, this is based on the testing. It should be simpler than the testing uh, platform that we have, but we're fairly familiar with this platform in terms of uh, its base uh, capability. And we've used it before with our testing. As you know, testing is centralized. Um, you come into one database to register for all 19 clinics around the state or a pop-up if the health department is having a pop-up. So we're fairly familiar with this uh, platform. And, ex and as it does in testing, it tells you the location, it tells you the time, it gives you the slot. Um, so we're fairly familiar with this. We think we're... Uh, we, we have a high degree of confidence in this. Thanks. Uh, Colin, I just want to add to that. Um, I think we need to reset the expectations here. Um, from my perspective, uh, we are concerned about every time we open up a, a new band, there will be a run on the system. There will be, because everyone's anxious to sign up. So we expect that there will be a bit of a bottleneck in the beginning, but that's why we're advocating for people to go to the online system first uh, and not call in. It's the call-ins that's going to be uh, the issue, even though we have utilizing an out outside entity uh, to do the reservations. I don't know if we're, you know, we have how many um, callers uh, from the call center? 200 now. Two, yeah. 200 uh, reservationists, so to speak, uh, now, and we're hoping to ramp that up further, we think, to 400, uh, I believe, is the number. Uh, but, uh, but again, you know, we are concerned uh, about that initial uh, run on, uh, on the number of people who want to get in and get their reservations made. Thank you, Governor. Mike, the Islander. Mike 
Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Secretary French, uh, Commissioner Levine said today he was unaware of any problem with the uh, COVID issues with high school sports. Just wondering what the uh, education agency knows about a possible outbreak or problem in Chittenden County that resulted in one high school stopping basketball practices for two weeks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I'm not aware of the specific situation. Um, <clears throat> in our guidance, you know, we put a hold on practice per se. Uh, schools have been confined to doing sort of low level skill drills and so forth. Um, so, I, you know, I, to echo on the governor's previous comment, Dr. Levine's observation, um, I feel comfortable with this next step. Our schools have demonstrated the capacity, um, you know, to manage uh, their operations in spite of the challenging context in which they're, they're operating. Um, but I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the specific case that you're describing. And I, may, I may call them practices, but skills drills, but basically <clears throat> basketball team sidelines. My other question uh, for uh, the governor, maybe, um, you've always sided with transparency Yet uh, the health department last month for first course and no longer makes a list of COVID outbreaks readily available. And now the public has to go through formal public records requests. And the law is pretty clear that it's supposed to be a prompt response, yet we've been waiting two weeks for the list of outbreaks. Old Tuesday, the list was forthcoming, still haven't gotten it. And the health department does post specific restaurant inspection scores in the problems and everything. And so is there anything you can do as governor to restore transparency and help Vermonters learn about outbreaks in their areas, especially in light of numbers that are skyrocketing? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the term skyrocketing uh, in some respects. I mean, we're getting to this... Uh, new normal uh, that we've seen across the region. Um, but um, from my standpoint, we're trying to give all the information we can within the letter of the law. Um, we want to make sure that, but I, but I share uh, your frustration in not getting the information as quick as, as uh, possible. Uh, so that's something that I can, I can look into and be happy to, uh, to make sure that when you make the requests uh, that we, uh, we expedite that as, as quickly as we possibly can. So I, I will look into that. Okay, thank you. I just, uh, I, I was just wondering because it's supposed to be promptly, as you know, uh, the response, and they haven't been prompt. Do you get a list yourself uh, ever? Have you seen any lists at any point, uh, or do they just give you numbers and you have you're unaware that what places have had them as governor? No, I I see a list. It's confidential, but I see it. So it's a matter of redaction for them. Um, well, it would be heavy redacting. I mean, that would be back to numbers again. Okay. And that's all we're looking for. We're going to, we still have more than half our list left, so we're going to move. No. We're going to move to Andrew. No, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Andrew McKeever, GNAT TV. Uh, hello. Go ahead, Andrew. Um, I, I had a question uh, about PCR testing. I've um, been hearing from a couple of our viewers that uh, getting a PCR test uh, down here in the, in the Bennington County area has been uh, uh, not as automatic as, as they would have liked. And I guess I was just wondering, if there were any plans in place to expand the number of testing sites for PCR tests, and and also uh, sort of as a follow-up was uh, one one person uh, told me that they had they were asked uh, to pay two hundred dollars for a, a test at a local private clinic, and I just wondered if that was like a typical price or or was that yeah unusual? Uh, again, I would I would say I don't want to speak for the entity. Um, but if you sign up on our website, on the health department website, they're free. Uh, so I would advocate go there first. We have uh, anywhere from 17 to 19 fixed sites on a daily basis. Uh, so uh, what I've heard from people is that it's fairly easy to get in line, get, get a test scheduled. Uh, so please, uh, if you can, get your viewers or your readers 
uh, to go to the, the health department website and sign up there because they're free and, uh, and you should be able to get in fairly quick. So Dr. Levine, anything you can add to that? Yeah, so everything the governor said is completely true. In addition, you know, um, with our partnership with Southwest Vermont Medical Center, um, that's actually a, a gem, if I could call it that. Um, and things have gone very smoothly. So I'd wonder what went on with the particular person you were uh, mentioning, uh, because that's definitely not been the rule by any means. Okay. Um, all righty. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time and your help. Thank you very much. Lisa, Waterbury Roundabout. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey there. I think um, my first question is for uh, Secretary French regarding schools. You came really close in your report, Secretary French, when you were talking about the percentages of students in the different grade levels um, attending in person right now. And when you started mentioning the distancing, I was hoping you were going to mention this detail as well. But in our school district, we're one of those where students from grades 7 and up are only in school in person two days a week because they say that the distancing requirements and the space available doesn't allow for them to have everybody there at the same time. Um, people were pretty excited to hear w about the goal to try to get students in school close to full time later this spring. But we're wondering just what what is going to have to give in order to make that happen? How do we get there from here? Will the distancing guidance get tweaked? Will the state look at tents or something to have more outside classes? How do we how do we bridge that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, my first observation, as you mentioned, your school is a 7 through 12 school, which is one of uh, many uh, configurations that we have across the state. So, you know, most people are familiar with the traditional 9 through 12 high school. Um, we have several K through 12 high schools. I was the principal of one. Um, and then we have schools like 7 through 12. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty diverse landscape in terms of uh, we start thinking about things like distancing. So I would, I would make the observation um, that our guidance has always been reflective of our specific context in the state. So arguably, uh, we achieved uh, Vermonters working together some of the best conditions uh, for operating schools back in, in September uh, through the sacrifice and hard work of all Vermonters. And uh, at the same time, however, we built very restrictive uh, guidance. So we, we implemented masks and so forth and distancing requirements. So we were very aggressive in all those regards. And I think uh, the other element of that is that districts have learned uh, how to execute um, on those plans um, con con all the time. So, you know, I think, you know, our guidance has always been a reflection of the conditions that we operate in. So I think you're right. And this is kind of where I was going with my comments. Um, our, our, our guidance will continue to evolve as the conditions evolve. Uh, we certainly expect the conditions to improve, um, feeling more confident about that every day as we see um, the trend in the data from the holiday period. Um, so certainly with the advent of vaccine, um, with the warmer weather coming our way, um, our, uh, our conditions will most likely improve and um, therefore our guidance will, will adapt uh, to that. Um, and we just want to signal at this point that that sort of starts to come together sometime after April vacation. And it's, uh, it's not as simple as um, pivoting the system uh, overnight. We have to prepare for that. So that's why we're sort of signaling that now so we can start making the preparations. Okay, thank you. We'll be, we'll be watching for that, I suppose. Um, we have a, one school that's five to eight with two different sets of requirements and kids attending different numbers of days a week. So it's, it's confusing. Um, but that's good to hear. Um, I think the other question that I have regarding case data might be for Secretary Smith or Dr. Levine. I noticed today the town-by-town -town map that gets released on Fridays was revised so that it's now, the table that's with it is now um, sorted in alphabetical order instead of by case number order. And it makes me wonder if there's a possibility of sorting the data in a way that reveals the 911 addresses not, not addresses, but sort of sorted by the towns that people have their 911 address rather than their mailing address. Um, I'm starting to hear just frustration from communities near Waterbury 
that don't have their own post offices or zip codes, and people who live in nearby communities aren't getting their cases logged based on their town. They're basically getting logged based on the town where their zip code is. Um, so there's several communities, for example, in our school district that have zero cases, even though people know that there are people with cases there, and they get sort of logged with other towns. And it seems like they're falling through the cracks because I talked to one select board member who said this is really frustrating. It's hard to tell people that they need to be minding the guidance if they look at the map and they say, well, there's, we don't have any cases in our town. Um, I'm just wondering if that's a data, a data manipulation glitch or, or possibility where it could be sorted more specifically. If you look at the map, there's a lot of towns with zeros, and I wonder if it's really reflecting of what the reality is. Lisa, um, my agency um, holds their breath every time I come to the podium uh, because they're so afraid I'm going to make policy at the podium. Um, I really, um, let me do this, let me delve into that issue. I don't know what the complications are, and before I promise anything, that um, that the um, that will get me and you into hot water. Let me find out what's what's going on. Thank you, because I've had numerous emails from various people from the towns that are zeros, and they mm -hmm. are frustrated because they they don't feel like they're getting an accurate picture of what the situation is mm -hmm. in their community, and that that would be helpful information for people to have. And I also want to just go back to Colin at seven days so I don't get in trouble with my boss. I thought he was referring to the online system, not the total system. I am worried about um, call-ins. Um, we, we will have call-ins. As the governor said, um, you know, we are trying to get people to register online, but we understand that some people can't. And we do, we will have a call center up and running. But, um, you know, if everybody calls at once, uh, that will be problematic. So as I said in my remarks, uh, please, uh, if you're a child, grandchild, or friend of somebody that may, be, that may have difficulty uh, registering online, please help them. Please help them register online. It will make things a lot easier. And Dr. Levine, did you have anything more to say about um, the question. I just wanted to make a quick point. First of all, our health surveillance and statistics will have heard what you just said and will have a much better insight um, into why that is or is not possible and how to make it effective. But the point I really want to make is what you said about looking at zero and saying, why do we have to do all this? I don't want anybody to look at numbers at all. If there's a message that needs to get across today, it is this is a every day of the year exercise right now for all of us to do everything that we can do to prevent transmitting virus from one of us to another, especially to another who may be more susceptible for a severe and more serious outcome. So whether you have no cases recorded in your zip code or in your town, or whether you have 10 cases recorded in your zip code or your town, you still need to do the same exact behaviors. It's not like we rev it up a little because we see a number go one way or the other. We have to be constantly vigilant, and that's why when the governor says we can't drop our guard, um, that's what he means. Thank you. Matt, WPP. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh. Can you, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? But sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering. Oh, thank you, Governor. I was wondering if uh, Commissioner Sherling could just give an update. I know we've you know been hearing throughout the week in regards to what could happen in the coming days, um, potentially on Sunday and on Wednesday. Um, we've heard that there are possibly no known threats at this time. Didn't know if you could just give a brief update um, for Vermonters about you know if there are any developments, if we, if we can expect any armed protests at the state house or anything in general to that effect. Sure, happy to give a brief update. Uh, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, 
No, again, no known uh, threats here in Vermont. Uh, certainly extra vigilance uh, today through at least the 20th as we continue to monitor uh, national threat streams. Um, as I mentioned on a couple of different calls yesterday, you'll see an altered um, uh, presence in Montpelier in particular, but also in some other areas uh, of Vermont with some more high visibility. Uh, I think if you look next door to the State House right now, uh, that is uh, on display. Um, and we continue to ask that Vermonters uh, engage in the, uh, the see something, say something campaign. If you see anything that looks like a threat or looks like it's off, um, please let your local law enforcement know or hit our tip line um, and uh, continue to call for folks to, uh, to really think hard about whether uh, any kind of demonstration over the next few days is, is prudent under the circumstances. And, and going off that, my next question, um, are you, there is a Facebook event um, that appears to be for a demonstration um, or a rally on Sunday. I don't know if you're aware of that and if you have a message to those organizers um, who may still be going through with having this event. Yes, uh, we are aware of a couple of uh, Facebook posts around potential gatherings and um, you know, the, the message stays consistent since, uh, since Tuesday. Um, you know, we, we certainly recognize folks' uh, uh, rights to, to exercise their First Amendment rights on a variety of topics, just uh, would urge them to uh, take into account everything that's going on now, the heightened anxiety on the part uh, of the nation and certainly here in Vermont, and think about whether uh, this is the right timing for those uh, demonstrations, protests, events, or gatherings. Great. Thank you very much. As, as well, if I could uh, go a little bit further with that, uh, there was a request uh, to use the State House lawn um, by a group uh, this Sunday, and um, more of a family at atmosphere and and uh, having food and so forth and bring your families. Um, we have reached out to them. Uh, uh, Buildings and General Services has reached back out to them and uh, to convince them uh, to pick another day, uh, that this isn't the time. Uh, we we don't we aren't encouraging anyone uh, to come to the state house lawn on Sunday. We understand that you're right to do so, um, but we believe in the in the um, to keep everyone safe uh, that uh, that this isn't the day to do it. So we'd advocate for another day. Okay, we'll move to Joe at the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello, Governor. A while back, you faced some criticism, um, or at least questions in this forum, about your use of executive orders to um, implement the uh, measures you thought proper for uh, protecting Vermonters against COVID. And one of the things that you said at the time was that the alternative was having to go to the legislature all the time, and it was impossible to see things done in a timely fashion. I see now, though, that you have issued an executive order reorganizing the Natural Resources Board, um, a measure that in large part was uh, in a bill that was defeated in the 2020 session of the legislature. Um, I see that the legislature has the option of refusing to allow you to do it, but given that the measure would go into effect uh, on July 1st, isn't there enough time to take the normal route of asking the legislature for the changes that you want? Yeah, uh, let me clear a couple things up. First of all, uh, at the start of any biennium, um, this is the opportunity. This is what's uh, in, in is, is our ability uh, to time to restructure government. So this is done frequently. We did it with the liquor lottery um, uh, board uh, before. We did it uh, developing the Agency of Digital Services uh, in 2017. 
so this is commonplace. Uh, and this was not part of a previous bill uh, that the that the legislature didn't uh, move forward or, or didn't uh, uh, that turned down. Uh, in fact, uh, the NRB uh, was in uh, a House version, and they actually moved it forward. Uh, so we think uh, there's uh, there's um, there's some um, common interest here. Uh, amongst the legislature. Um, we're going to work with them because we think this is a, a strategic move. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't the answer for modernization, the total answer for modernization of Act 250. We have a lot of other things we want to do uh, within Act 250 and we'll move through the regular process to do so. Uh, there, will be, there will be a bill uh, introduced or many bills introduced along those lines. But this is a restructuring of government. Uh, so this is in in the realm of, of uh, our ability to do so, but we only have a short window uh, to do it. We had to do it uh, by today, as a matter of fact. So um, this, is, this is something that's commonplace. So um, this is not the ordinary. It might even take some of the burden off from the legislature in some respects, uh, because as you might recall, they have said they want to focus, rightfully so, on COVID, uh, COVID-related issues. And, uh, and I agree uh, with that. But again, this is a, a short window. We have the ability to do it. Uh, we think this uh, makes a lot of sense and uh, we'll, we'll ask for their approval. If they don't, uh, then we'll, we'll take a different route. Thank you. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Hello and thank you. Um, I think this question might be for Secretary Smith. I actually have a, a question from a reader in real time, uh, someone who's going to be eligible to uh, register for the vaccine on the 25th and wanted to know is um, if they go through the website, will they be able to schedule for, um, for husband and wife to get their appointment at the same time? Uh, so it's kind of a practical question about whether family members can, will, will there be allowance for that? Let me just ask a clarifying question. Is the, is the spouse over 75? Yes. Yes. I, I believe so. Yes, they will. Okay. Um, if they weren't, we'll, 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 let's take that to the next step then. If, if they weren't uh, both uh, over 75, then what, is that, does that, would that necessarily have to be, are we, are, are we being very strict about that? Can you just sort of repeat it? I mean, the way that it would work okay. is, if, it, it, the way that it would work is similar to the testing, is that you would put in, two names into that registration process, but you could register at, at the same time. It, it, am I making myself clear on that? Yes, yes. Okay. That's it. Um, Dr. Levy, really did you wanna clear something up? Just wanted, <coughs> excuse me, just wanted to clear up uh, when we were talking about uh, health equity and the BIPOC population, um, individuals in the same household. So when you look at what we call a community vulnerability index, it really advances the cause of health equity right up front because it shows a lot of the factors that put certain populations at higher risk than others for more adverse outcomes from COVID-19 in particular. And congregate living is certainly one of those that factors in with abundant other factors that affect the BIPOC population and make their risk elevated. Uh, so that, when I was referring to uh, making sure that we could attend to the vaccine needs of individuals living in a, perhaps a multi-generational household, it was specifically referring to that population due to uh, data coming from a community vulnerability index frame of reference, if you will, all about health equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm done. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. I, I think Greg was referring to if, if one spouse was under 75. Yeah. They could, um, I th we are going to adhere to the, to the 75 and over. Um, so we want you to stay within the, the age banding. Okay. Um, and sort of along those, those lines in, in real-time responses to this uh, press conference, um, 
there's concern that, uh, you know, people in their 60s who don't have any comorbidities would seem to be pretty low risk of death, which is the, the standard here we're talking about. And uh, people are concerned about why, why people who are unhealthy, who have maybe these severe conditions you're talking about, wouldn't be pushed up um, instead of going into the, the 60s age band, the 65 plus age band, why not? Why, why are they getting preferences when they, uh, as I understand it, there are very few uh, deaths in that group who don't have a comorbidity, so why not push the comorbidity uh, people or the, or the really unhealthy people up that were described previously? Again, I'll let uh, Commissioner Levine answer that, but uh, from our standpoint, we looked at the data. Um, it seemed 65 and over uh, were, were uh, the most uh, deaths um, we, we experienced. Um, and um, more in that category than in those who have chronic conditions. So again, the, the graph that Secretary Smith, oh my gosh, there it is, uh, clearly shows why the ages uh, are where the risks are. Uh, and it's below age um, 65 where the risk drops off tremendously. That's the risk of death. And that is our primary goal, is to preserve life. But having said that, these other conditions for which there's a broader age span beginning below age 65 are still viewed as conditions that uh, can lead to a more serious consequence if you have the virus. So obviously the most serious consequence is death. No, no argument there. But other serious consequences <laughs> hospitalizations, hospitalizations that require critical care, hospitalizations that require mechanical ventilation. These are all associated with those other conditions. And that's why they're listed next, but not as high as the first three age bands that we mentioned. Does that answer your question? Uh uh yes, thank you. And just to just to clarify because I was un uncertain about the BIPOC pulp Population, would they are they in that next band then with the um, um, the under sixty five group? So they're in every band, obviously all along. Um, although we tend to skew younger in the BIPOC population uh, in Vermont, That's what I mean. so majority of them will probably come uh, after those initial <clears throat> higher age bands. You're correct. Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning, Governor. Um, I'm excited to hear that Secretary Smith is going to look into the zip code issue that Lisa mentioned. As you know, I brought that up in May, and I was told unequivocally that the counts were accurate, and they did go town by town and not by zip code. So I'm glad it's being taken seriously, and I'd, I'd be interested in that data when it's available. That being said, um, I'd like to ask about sports. With Phase 2 uh, beginning next week, if outdoor sports are allowed, does this mean that, you know, two hockey teams from two different schools can compete if they're competing in an outdoor rink? And uh, secondary part to the, the sports question, uh, with it restarting next week, is it really practical that, that we're going to see indoor sports beginning before February and, and obviously uh, typical playoffs would be coming soon? Yeah. Uh, in regards to your first question, uh, no competition uh, at this point in time. Uh, we are saying inter-school, uh, inter-team scrimmages only. Uh, so that's the phase two. Uh, and, and the answer to your next question, I don't know uh, when exactly that's going to be, um, but, um, but we'll just have to see uh, what the data and science tells us, and then we'll make determinations along the way as to when we will go to the next phase in terms of sports. Did I understand correctly that outdoor uh, sports like downhill skiing would be allowed? Yes. Okay, just not outdoor hockey. Well, no, I mean, you can still scrimmage 
and you can still have inter-school, uh, inter-team uh, scrimmages, but not not teams from a, uh, you know from another another school. Uh, Yes, Governor, I'm, I'm happy. To, this is yeah. Julie Moore. I'm happy to help clarify a little, if you'd like. Sure. Sure. Just um, so that uh, there is an allowance within the the guidance that's published today for small competitions for outdoor sports: Nordic skiing, downhill skiing, or yeah, downhill skiing and snowboarding. Uh, School-based hockey is an is an indoor sport. Um, and so they are, are limited to, to practices only at this point in time. Um, there's separate guidance that pertains to, to outdoor recreation. So if folks are having informal family-based games outside, um, that's a different set of standards uh, than the, the school-based and youth recreational sports. These are, these are looking at formal organized sports. Uh, certainly, I was just curious because I, I think uh, Stowe High School, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw that South Burlington now has an outdoor rink. I didn't know if those would be uh, utilized or, or be allowed to be utilized uh, for teams. Certainly, they would be encouraged to practice there, and the, the guidance documents have specific statements prioritizing outdoor activity as opposed to indoor activity. Um, but it doesn't change whether or not competitions would be allowed at this point in time for, the, for hockey. Okay. Thank you. Have a great weekend, Governor and staff. Thank you. Ian Galloway, VT Digger. Hi, this is Ann Galloway. Governor, um, I have a question about recent events. Um, Senator Lisa Murkowski recently said that if the Republican Party has become nothing more than the party of Trump, I sincerely question whether this party is for me. Have you also been questioning your continued affiliation with the Republican Party, given the events of the past two weeks? Yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, over the last four years, as you know, um, I have not been a supporter of the president. Uh, I didn't vote uh, for him in the primary, nor in the um, first election, nor in the second election. So um, from my standpoint, I'm a Republican uh, who doesn't support um, President Trump. Now, I think the Republican Party is going to have to do some soul searching and figure out what our values are, uh, what we can agree upon, um, and whether indeed they believe this is uh, a party of, uh, of Trump, um, whether they're, um, if they're going to continue with uh, some of what I perceive as uh, uh, white supremacy um, uh, dominating, um, racial inequity and so forth, uh, then we'll all have to uh, make some decisions. Uh, but I'm hopeful that uh, the Republican Party will get back uh, to its roots and uh, be the party that I perceive them to be. And so um, based uh, on you know, smaller government, uh, economic uh, opportunity, uh, capitalism, and so forth. But, um, but time will tell. I mean, I don't think that's going to be decided this week. Uh, from my st uh, standpoint, I think it's uh, time for us all to reflect and for those who are in control of the parties at this point in time to reflect as well. Uh, Governor, leaders of the Republican Party have been spreading conspiracy theories about a free and fair election and last week helped incite a violent assault on the U.S. Capitol. If that doesn't cause you to question your role in the party, what would? Well, I think I've been very vocal, and as you have probably written about, uh, about uh, what I believe, this was a fair uh, election, uh, that there was no evidence whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, nothing that had come forward. Nobody presented evidence to the contrary. Um, it was more about uh, uh, the president trying to manipulate the system uh, to continue to be president. So uh, that isn't my belief. I, I don't believe, uh, uh, I, you know, as we saw, there was a strong vote uh, in, in uh, the Vermont uh, State House, uh, both in the House and the Senate. Um, saying just that. So uh, again, condemning the actions uh, of, the, of what happened last week. And uh, again, I know there are Republicans in the House and Senate uh, who believe, as I do, uh, that uh, uh, that was a fair election and that we need to 
uh, to move on from there uh, and uh, to condemn the actions taken by the president. But that wouldn't cause you to leave the party. Well, again, I mean, there's going to be time enough to to do some soul searching, figure out uh, what the what the party wants to represent, who they want to be, and uh, we'll all have to make decisions at that point. Do you think that Deb Bilodeau should resign as chair of the Vermont Republican Party? And I'm sorry, can you? What, what was the question again? Yeah, I, sure. Do you agree with Senator Parent? Representative Beck and Representative Donahue, that Deb Bilodeau should resign as chair of the Vermont Republican Party. Well, I think uh, I think the Republican Party again. Uh, some of the uh, officials in the party uh, have to do some soul searching as to what uh, the party represents, and and having uh, more of um, reflect the values that the elected officials have. So um, again, we'll we'll have those conversations over the next few months and uh, determine where, what direction the party goes. Thank you, Governor. Pam Davis of Vermont Journal. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a question for, uh, I think, Mike Smith. Um, well, there was sort of the rate limiting variable on the on the whole vaccine uh, uh, landscape is the availability of the doses themselves, and so far I think they've been they've been distributed on the basis of population. But there's been two kinds of discussions that could affect that. One is that uh, the, the president elect has suggested that we uh, drop back from um, two two shots to one, and thereby uh, vastly increase the number of uh, doses that are available. Secondly, there's been some talk. I'm not sure how serious it is that you, the uh, that we uh, that the federal government might shift its basis of distribution to the level of to the rate at which a given state is uh, is uh, inoculating its people. Now our number now is high, as Mike Smith said, at seven. Okay, but if but if many states begin to uh, switch from two shots to one shot, okay, then the, uh, the rate at which other states are, do, are distributing will go up way higher, it seems. Have you assessed, my question is, have you assessed this, uh, this possibility? And if so, have you thought about whether you, you'd shift your current policy to go from uh, one shot to two? Thank you. Um, again, uh, we have our reservations in terms of just giving the one um, one shot, one inoculation, because it's most effective with two, two shots, uh, the second booster shot. I might ask Dr. Levine to comment on that first, and then Secretary Smith with anything else that might be added. Yeah, there are a lot of conversations happening, uh, and some of them are ending up in the newspaper, but clearly there's no federal guidance or CDC or science-driven guidance to indicate that we should be giving one shot to a large population and then hit or miss on the second shot, depending if there's still vaccine left over at a later time, and God knows when that later time will be. So we are subscribing currently to continuing to honor the promise we made, which is if you get a first shot, we'll have a dose reserved for you for the second shot. I've also had a chance to review some recent data, very preliminary data, looking at Pfizer, that indicates that after the first shot, within a two-week period, the um, vaccine of, uh, eff efficacy rate is in the 50 percent. But quickly after the second shot, it shoots up into the 90 percent. That's pretty convincing to me to say that we're doing the right thing. Uh, but we need a lot more of that kind of data to help support uh, science-driven decision-making at this time. And Mike Smith, um, I'm very aware of the federal government uh, trying to um, performance base the, the vaccine allocation. I would be worried if they did it performance based uh, based upon the one shot theory that you talked about. Obviously, we are doing very well uh, right now, and uh, we would expect uh, on a performance based uh, basis that we would get um, more vaccine. But uh, we would be very, 
it, it would be um, unfortunate if they went to that sort of system and we would vigorously argue against that system. We, we would think it's unfair and we would think it's, um, as Dr. Levine had talked about, has a lot of pitfalls to it. Thank you. Yeah, I might add as well, uh, we have high hopes for a couple of more manufacturers to come through, Johnson Johnson, which is a single uh, dose strategy, uh, as well as AstraZeneca, who's doing trials here in Vermont. So hopefully uh, we'll have some good news there, which will increase the supply. Thank you. Lisa at the Valley Reporter. Can you hear me? We can. Good afternoon. Um, I've received a report to the effect that teachers and staff of Wyndham Southwest School District have already received their first dose of vaccine. I reached out to the school district for verification, and the person I spoke to said she was not at liberty to discuss that. I did not receive a call back from the superintendent. Can probably Secretary Smith or Dan French, can you confirm or deny that this school district has received vaccines? Um, this would be news uh, to us, Lisa, but, um, but I'd ask uh, Secretary French if he has any knowledge of this. Yes, yeah, so Secretary French, I have no knowledge of, of this information. First, I Great, heard it. Thank you. Thanks for running down rumors. Secondly, I just need a quick clarification from Secretary Smith. I asked you a couple of weeks ago about whether second homeowners who were sheltering in place in Vermont since last spring could receive the vaccine in Vermont rather than return to their home state. And you said they could. And today I heard you in response to a question about residency say that people would need to provide proof of residency. Can That's, you clarify? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain. I remember the first one about vaccines in particular. I'm, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, I, the, the fact is that second homeowners will not be eligible. They will have to return back to their home state. Now, if you have moved to this state and have a job and then, you know, within the last six months and have the intention to become a resident because you have to wait six months, um, then uh, that would be, uh, you would be eligible at that point, but a second homeowner would not be eligible for a vaccine under the Vermont vaccination program. And, and, gotcha. and can I just return? Sorry, go ahead. No, if I was unclear a few weeks ago, then I apologize. I just don't remember saying that, but maybe I did. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Could I just ask Secretary French quickly, will you double check on that school district I just received a text from somebody who suggested that that had, in fact, occurred. And that was yes, um, Wyndham Southwest. Okay, yeah. I'm going to put myself on mute because the dogs are about to bark. Yeah, uh, yeah, Lisa, we're, we're interested in running that down as well. Guy Page? Uh, Governor or hi, uh, Governor or Commissioner Levine. Uh, last week you didn't have any data about vaccine acceptance rate. Can you now tell us more about the rate at which Vermonters offered the vaccine are refusing to take it? And also, do you have any information on cases of side effects from receiving the first dose? Yeah, thanks for the question. So we do know that, um, and then I don't want you to hang your hat on numbers because this is a moving target right now. We're still within 1A. So it's even hard to say somebody who's in a nursing home who didn't get the vaccine refused it because it may have been a problem with the informed consent process through a relative in a timely manner. Likewise, in a healthcare uh, worker, we're finding frequent reports actually of people who did not step to the front of the line, but now several weeks later said, I'm willing to take the vaccine today. Uh, so it's a very hard answer to give you. We're hearing over 80% in the nursing homes for the uh, residents 
I don't have a rate within the staff at the nursing homes. So that's very promising. And again, I've, I've used this number before for the healthcare facilities. Um, when the hospitals have surveyed, the rates have progressively increased over time of who would take the vaccine. Um, and that has gone from 60 to 70 to 80 percent, but I can't give you a number that's a final number yet for the healthcare workforce. With regard to adverse events, these are reported through what's called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, and anything can be reported. We've had a total of 25 adverse events listed so far, and I believe that only brings us up to January because there's a lag in that system into getting the data back to us. It's a uh, federal system. But the bottom line is, out of those 25, there were two individuals we're aware of that had shortness of breath as part of the symptoms that they reported, though not frank anaphylaxis. So those obviously required more attention. Um, there are a number of events that are just listed as local reactions as opposed to systemic reactions. Um, think about 25 in the context of 25-ish thousand, you know, doses administered. Um, I also promised to bring back some data regarding uh, wastage of the vaccine. And at this point in time, we're aware of about 63 doses total that are wasted. And that's, again, in the context of 70,000 doses particularly. So it's about a 0.1% rate of wastage. So very, very low number when you look at it in comparison to the total number of doses coming in the state. I would still say it's unacceptable because obviously uh, any dose wasted is uh, unfortunate uh, and that's what we will certainly keep a very close eye on and make sure we can minimize throughout the next uh, months and months of vaccination. Thank you. Malia, Burlington Free Pass. For either Secretary Smith or for Dr. Levine, I'm wondering, and I think this has been kind of touched on, but um, is Vermont's decision to focus this next round of vaccinations on older Vermonters as well as those who have chronic health conditions does that mean that the state's main goal is to vaccinate people who are most at risk of dying from COVID as opposed to those who are most at risk of contracting the, the disease like essential workers? And if that's the case, is the state at all concerned that this rollout of the next phase could come at the expense of mitigating community spread in Vermont? Uh, again, I think we've been very clear. Uh, this is about keeping people alive. Uh, those at greatest risk of dying, we're trying to get to first and have them vaccinated to prevent that from happening. So I think we've been very, very clear on that, and hopefully there's no daylight there whatsoever. Um, in terms of whether there's going to be community spread, um, that's still up to us, you know, individually. Uh, we've said from the very beginning, and look what we went through uh, last summer when we were able to reduce that by wearing a mask, keeping physically distance, uh, washing our hands a lot, um, just taking all the guidance, all the protocols that we put into place, we we're able to bring that number down to almost nothing. I contend we still have that ability today. And it's up to us to make sure that we do that until we're able to vaccinate the vast majority of the population, which is going to take some time based on the limited number of vaccine uh, that we have coming into the state. Now, if that increases, uh, then we'll get to it quicker. Uh, but, uh, but meanwhile, uh, we have to, we're uh, at the mercy, uh, in some respects, of the federal government and how much of the vaccine we're going to receive. But we'll distribute it just as fast as we get it. Great, thank you. Steve, WDEV. I want to follow up on Greg's question about winter sports. 
Um, and I do understand that you need to continue to watch the data before you decide to move to phase three in winter sports. My question is, do you, do you have a deadline to make that decision if there is going to be a winter sport season, specifically high school basketball? Uh, and I ask that question because we're the clock's ticking. We're about two months before the season typically ends. Yeah, um, Steve, uh, good question. I might prefer to Secretary Moore on this, but we have uh, spoken to some of the, uh, I think the VPA about extending the season, maybe going into a different um, different time than we normally uh, have some of these sports. Secretary Moore. Uh, Governor, Secretary Curley, Secretary Moore, I had to jump off. Okay. I'm happy to, to try to tackle this one. Um, yeah, the, the VPA has worked with the schools, and there's a broad agreement to extend the season to the end of March, I believe. Um, so, honestly, that's, you know, maybe just two to three weeks longer than or, you know, later than what we would normally stop at in the state. We know um, we certainly do understand the clock ticking, and we know that our our window is short, but as the governor has said, we really don't want to make a move until we're comfortable that um, that we can safely do so. And just a quick follow up, if I could, on that. Um, you know, what we've been hearing was that the season was going to be about 15 to 16 games uh, total, uh, compared to 25 to 30. Do you have a limit of the number of games that you're willing to get down to to, con to continue to have some sort of a season this year? Well, that really would be up to the to the BPA, but um, we really are trying not to, to put a hard number on that because everything is so fluid right now. Folks are trying to just do the best they can, um, getting the kids back into a um, – a situation where they can practice as a full team with incidental contact um, right now is, is, a, is a good good move for us to see how things are going to go. Um, and again, we're just asking, um, you know, there's, there's ice arenas and other folks who sometimes pull the ice out uh, in, in late February. So just asking people to keep an open mind on, on some of that. And it's, it's going to be a challenge, but we don't have sort of this drop dead date, you know, we can't do it. Um, you know, that we've, I, I think in the back of people's minds, it's there, but we're trying not to, to um, overwhelm the decision making with that. Great. Thank you for your time. All right. We are at 111, and we still have three callers in the queue. Steve, the NEK, NEK TV. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, 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 thanks. I uh, something happened at the at the last uh, at the last conference, and I was cut off before I could. Uh, thank you guys for answering a question. Uh, I it was a sin when I was growing up to be impolite, so I just wanted to get that out first. Oh, we never think uh, you're we'll, impolite, we'll, Steve. No, well, thank you. May not agree much, with you, Governor. but uh, not impolite. <laughs> well, that's the Vermont way, thank goodness. Uh, the, uh, governor, uh, one for the governor, one for the doctor, if I may. Uh, governor, the CDC just approved a, a rapid antigen test for travel into the U.S., and I had a question from a viewer. Um, why don't we use these, uh, these uh, cheap tests? They're as, as low as... Uh, five bucks and they take five minutes to uh to maybe help uh, end the lockdowns and uh open up businesses yeah i uh, from my standpoint i think they are going to be part of the future uh actually uh, but um i don't know if we have the supply or the inventory uh and and that they're accessible at this point but i might ask uh, dr levine this might be his, part of his question as well thanks you, you get two at me today, Steve. Uh, so the antigen Great, test, thank you. you know, the antigen test has a lot of utility in a lot of settings. But I would submit that if you were creating sort of a point where a traveler could come in or not come in, contingent on the result of that specific test, I don't think that would be very wise. Because the thing you fear the most is somebody coming in who has no symptoms but might be infectious. 
and the antigen test is more vulnerable to producing a false negative result at that time. Obviously, if the person comes off the plane and they're coughing and sneezing and febrile, um, probably going to rely on the antigen test to show that they have COVID because that's when it's most reliable. So it, again, depends on how they're planning on actually implementing something like that and would it have any real basis in science to make a decision that is so critical. If the decision was you still were going to quarantine no matter what, uh, it's less of a significant point. But my sense is when you start using tests, you've aut automatically eliminated quarantine and you're just saying it's either you're in or out and that's it. Is that clear? Sure. Um, and uh, a couple of a couple of conferences ago, I'd, I'd asked you about adjuvants, and uh, you said you get back to me. Um, from what I understand, uh, the adjuvants that are currently used to provoke an immune response when uh, somebody gets the vaccine is uh, mm -hmm. aluminum and magnesium hydroxide, uh, some kind of emulsion adjuvant, uh, and a TLL, uh, TLR agonist, and uh, others. Um, do you know what uh, kind of adjuvants they're using, this being uh, uh, an mRNA uh, new vaccine? Yeah, and I think that the, the real take-home point is certain platforms require an adjuvant to actually do what you said. I'm not sure if the mRNA even integrates that into it. So I will write that down right now and make sure that I get back to you on, on that with the mRNA, because that is of interest because I know that some of the other vaccine platforms will have adjuvants as part of their mode of uh, action, if you will. So let, let me get back to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, because I can't seem to find it. Uh, and uh, thanks to everybody. I appreciate it. John, Addison, Independent. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, now we can't. I have two questions. Hey, John, we're, well, we're only is, hearing uh, part of that. Can you start over? Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, two questions regarding churches. One are um, uh, churches being monitored to see if they're following the guidelines. Um, there's, you know, a lot of churches out there. I'm not sure who do it. Um, so uh, is there any plan to do that or, or have there been? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, maybe this is a Secretary Curley uh, question. Probably. Sure. Um, yeah, we don't specifically monitor churches or other businesses. Um, certainly if there's an outbreak, as you heard earlier in the in the press conference that we will, uh, the EPI team follows up and, and we learn um, from, from the outbreaks that happen there. And so, uh, you know, we don't have any uh, plans at the moment to specifically monitor churches or, again, any other business in particular, um, but we, we have our portal, so we do receive um, uh, a variety of, of input from the community, um, you know, on, on things like areas and convenience stores and churches and we generally follow up we either pick up the phone and call them for um, a conversation to help them uh, better adhere to the guidelines or um, sometimes even make a visit to see how they're doing and, and help them get into better compliance excuse me secretary do you know how, curly do you know how many um, uh, tips you followed up on is it in the like the dozens uh, you know, or the hundreds are you talking about just for churches uh, which, if you know that, certainly, if you don't, just in general. Yeah, I, I don't know that for sure, to be honest. Um, the portal goes into the Vermont State Police, and mm -hmm. um, some also go come to us through the um, the contract tr contact tracing team uh, mm -hmm. for follow-up based on what they're learning in their investigation. So it's a variety. Mm -hmm. I don't know the number, um, but, you know, I would say that it's fair to say that there's been at least 100 since um, back in March, uh, but I, I don't know that for certain. 
that, that gives some context. I appreciate that. My second question um, was just uh, the state, when it tries to make um, enforce regulations, it generally takes a carrot and a stick approach. When it comes to enforcing uh, guidelines for uh, COVID with businesses and churches and, and other places, um, the carrot seems to be that, hey, you don't get sick. Uh, and the, is there a stick for the state to enforce uh, um, compliance with guidelines? Yeah, there's always the ability uh, to enforce in a much stricter way. We have just not cho chosen that path. Um, we have received, I think, uh, a lot of compliance through education and by conferring with them. But take, for instance, the, uh, the gym in Rutland. Uh, their enforcement was necessary in that case, and the Attorney General moved forward with that and, uh, in fact, um, deserves a lot of credit for moving in that manner and coming to resolution. Uh, but the vast majority of them, the complaints we receive, were able to, uh, again, contact them, uh, have a conversation, and, uh, and make sure that they're adhering and understand the rules and regulations. And, and for, for, for the most part, I think they've had been adhering to that, and it's been helpful. That's helpful. Thank you very much, Governor. All set. Thank you for circling back. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, uh, excellent. Uh, this is from a reader um, asking about uh, the perception that the Pfizer vaccine might cause more reactions than Moderna. Um, as you ramp up this registration um, process, uh, is there going to be an opportunity for people to choose one over the other, or is there any actual reason that one might want to? That would, that would be complicated, um, I'm afraid, uh, but uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Yeah, at the present time, uh, that's not being entertained. Uh, it would be far too complex. Um, also, that perception about the side effects, uh, I, I assume that's a perception based on sort of reading nationally as opposed to perhaps in Vermont. Uh, right now, you know, we don't really have enough data and enough sample size to really say anything regarding one having more or less side effects than the other. Um, Again, you know, the, there are side effects that are common and that are expected and that uh, a modest percentage of people might get that may inconvenience them for a 24-hour period or less. And then there's the far end of the spectrum, anaphylaxis, which is a rare side effect and, uh, again, could be with either vaccine, as we've seen uh, from national experience thus far. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Luvian, while you're at the podium, uh, um, you've, you've mentioned uh, don't call your health care providers or hospitals to book appointments, but what if people, uh, you know, as, as the age banding approaches, have questions about whether, uh, if or when they should get um, uh, dosage, uh, should they turn those questions to their uh, health care providers, or will your call center staff have any capacity to answer some of the more general questions like that? Yeah, so there's a little of both, but I think uh, getting the gist of your question has much more to do with that individual and who they are, what they, what they have for diseases, what they may or may not perceive as risk of getting the vaccine versus not getting the vaccine. Uh, those certainly would be questions much more appropriate for their health care provider um, or during the context of a visit, hopefully, uh, for other reasons, or as a phone call into their office. Um, but I, I do want to reiterate a point from earlier in the press conference, because I've already received a text, uh, and I already understand that there are phone calls coming into the health department regarding vaccination uh, as we speak. Uh, so I'd like to uh, get both Secretary Smith's and my uh, messages of earlier on, a couple hours ago now, uh, that the systems are not in place yet. If you call now, it's not going to get you any further uh, ahead in line, uh, and there is no list you're going to be put on. Uh, so I, we'd appreciate it if you hold those calls, and hopefully these conferences and other information you can find on our website will be very helpful to answer your questions. And do you know yet, uh, will the clinics, the vaccination clinics, have the same type of availability as the testing centers uh, that have been ramped up recently in terms of seven days a week, evening hours, or are they going to be more limited in their operations? 
This is Mike Smith. They'll be more limited in their operation, primarily because we won't have the vaccine. The vaccine limits the hours of operation. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you have a very safe weekend, and we'll talk to you again on Tuesday. Yeah.